This is going to be, I hope, a fairly interactive uh, process. My name is Pat Shea. Uh, I've been involved in Stanford ever since they made this mistake in 1966 of admitting me and then wondering how that happened. Uh, I was head of student government uh, when I was there and uh, wrote my senior thesis on the use of language ambiguity to create political conflict <laughs> and uh, did a study. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, Bruce Franklin was an English professor there and uh, he was very good as a Melville scholar at uh, creating ambiguity that uh, helped us in the, in the building of a, of a movement. And then I was president of the Alumni Association and uh, moved along uh, that way. But uh, it's a, an incredible institution and has certainly benefited me and many others uh, in our career. Uh, I also was the director of the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, it now may be going back to its old motto of the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, but uh, that is yet to be seen. Uh, and so today, uh, I want each of the panelists to take a few minutes to introduce themselves. And then uh, we've got a couple of questions, but I would urge you to look in your red pamphlet. There's a questionnaire in there that we designed that we would hope that you would fill out and give to one of the uh, Lane Center staff so we could do some compilation uh, afterwards. It's not. Uh, very extensive, but I think it would be informative uh, both to the Lane Center uh, and to me. Uh, I live in Salt Lake City, sort of the combat zone of uh, public lands, and uh, I wear this jacket because the target that they normally have on is covered by it, so, you know, it's fine. But uh, Tony Rampton is a high school classmate of mine and now works for the Utah Attorney General and uh, has been very active in public land. So, Tony, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, first of all, let me say that, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to thank Pat and I want to thank the uh, Bill Lane Center for inviting me uh, to Santa Fe to talk about a subject that uh, I'm very fond of. Um, I enjoy coming to Santa Fe. I was on a board, uh, Western States Arts Federation board that had its headquarters here in Santa Fe. I was on bo that board for about 15 years and so I came to Santa Fe four or five times a year and uh, got to know a lot of people, got to know a lot of Native Americans. Um, in any event, I love Santa Fe and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Just by way of background, uh, I uh, born and raised in Salt Lake City. I grew up in a political family. Um, I always have enjoyed the public lands. I'm an outdoorsman, I'm a sportsman, I'm a fly fisherman. And so uh, I've always been involved uh, with the public lands as a user of public lands. I also got an early taste of federal land policy uh, through my family. It was frequently a dinner table discussion topic and um, so anyway, that's my initiation to the public lands and the law that governs public lands. Uh, after uh, I went to law school, I practiced uh, law in the private sector for 37 years. I was um, what we call broadly a civil litigator, which meant I did uh, primarily trial work and. Uh, the work that builds up to trial. In that context, however, I uh, did a lot of uh, land use law. I did a lot of uh, uh, condemnation law. I did a lot of water law. I did a lot of uh, right-of-way uh, law across public lands. So I did get uh, a taste in my normal litigation uh, practice and then um, about 1977, I guess it was, I was hired by a company called Tosco, uh, the oil shale company. And that was back in the heyday of oil shale when there was a uh, shortage of petroleum in this country. We were concerned about developing uh, domestic supplies of petroleum. So oil shale was a big, big topic then. And I started out with Tosco doing their government relations work. And that led into, uh, I supervised all the land use and environmental permitting for a uh, 
multi-billion dollar project. So for a period of about six years, I did little else than uh, work on this oil shale project. And of course, when the bust occurred in 82, that all went away. Um, the, the way I got into uh, the position I'm in presently, and my official title right now is Director of the Public Lands Section of the Utah Attorney General's Office. Um, about five years ago, five and a half years ago, I just decided I'd had enough of the practice of law, the private practice. Um, I'm tired of billable hours, cranky clients, everything that goes along with the private practice of law, but I still wanted to work in the law because I love it. And uh, so this position came open and uh, I took it and I haven't regretted it for a moment. Now, uh, you might want to, I'm a, pol my politics are democratic, my political philosophy is progressive. You might add, what in the hell are you doing working in the Attorney General's office of the state of Utah? Well, it's because I love the public lands and I love the kind of work that I'm doing. It's very complex. It involves very critical issues to the Intermountain West. and. Uh, a lot of issues that are very, very sensitive issues. So uh, to close, uh, that's what I do right now, is public lands. That's all I do. And uh, I'm enjoying myself more than I have for 20 years. Nice to be with you. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say one thing about Jenna Whitlock, who will introduce herself. Uh, we had a litigator in the law firm that I was with who had a trial, and I was dating a woman who was on the jury, uh, and afterwards she told a story. She said, you know, if Dennis came in and told us that the sun was not going to rise, we would believe him. And uh, in working with Jenna when she was uh, acting state director of Utah, if she said the sun wouldn't rise, I would have believed her. She's one of the best public servants I've worked around. Thank you so much, Pat. And um, thanks for inviting me to be on this August panel. Um, uh, my name's Jenna Whitlock, and I, I just made it across the finish line and retired uh, after a 35-year career with the Bureau of Land Management. The last couple years of my career, I was sort of a utility infielder um, for BLM. Like Pat said, I was the acting state director for Utah BLM, quiet little state, um, and did that for um, about almost two years. And I, I just wrapped up my career as BLM's um, interim deputy director, so back in our um, nation's capital. Uh, but I started with BLM actually in a, a classic BLM office, one could have even said Bureau of Livestock and Mining as Elko, Nevada, and those were the two things we did, livestock grazing and gold mines. Um, from there, I, I literally threw a dart and went over and worked on spotted owl issues in Western Oregon. <laughs> and after I um, figured out that there was not enough coffee in the world to like cheer up those gray days in Western Oregon, I returned back to the Great Basin as the manager of the Owyhee field office, which at the time was the southwest three million acres of um, public lands in Idaho. Um, so after that experience, I knew I needed to get an advanced degree in political science, so I moved with the BLM to their BLM's headquarters in Washington, D.C., and um, laid low for a little while with my intent to become a legislative fellow. Um, and I did that, I worked in um, Senator Harry Reid's office uh, right after he became the majority leader. And uh, so worked on both national and Nevada um, public land issues as a fellow. Um, after that, I did a little hard time in the Wild Horse and Burrow program in Washington. <laughs> Um, and then decided I wanted to see BLM from yet another angle, so I work, went and worked in the Department of Interior in the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management, which is the Assistant Secretary over BLM. Got my seven-year itch, went back out to Utah as the Associate State Director and then the Interim State Director. And so that's kind of a little snapshot of my career, um, so you get my relationship to public lands. I've managed them for the last 30 years. Um, 
But I wanted to just add a little tidbit. Um, you don't have to go very far back in my family tree to find people who made their living from public lands. Um, my mom and dad were born and raised in um, Sam Pete County. Got a shout out for Sam Pete County, where Mrs. Eccles is also from, just down the road. Um, and so, dad, um, you know, spent, well, the family, like everybody else, ran cattle on the forest. And so dad, for um, his wasted youth, um, spent the, his time at the south end of a northbound cattle until he decided to go to college, and he too worked for BLM. And so between the two of us, we've got, I think, all but maybe three years of BLM's history covered. So it's a little bit about me. Uh, next is uh, John Freemuth, who's a professor of political science at Boise State. Uh, John and I have had a long association. He's the executive director of the Cecil Andrus uh, Center at Boise State. Uh, I always tell Governor Andrus, uh, I, when I worked for Senator Church, I could tell I was in trouble when Senator Church or his wife, Bethine, would say, why don't you call the Gov? And then I'd call the Gov and he'd chew me out because Senator Church and Mrs. Church didn't like to chew people out. But Governor Andrus was very, very good at it. And I always told Cease that there were three politicians I've worked for or with that I admired. One was Governor Rampton, Tony's father, Governor Andrus or Secretary Andrus, and Mike Mansfield. And uh, just think of what the world would be like if we had those kind of leaders today. John? Thanks, Pat. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I should probably say uh, first before I say anything about me that tomorrow is the fourth anniversary of the proclamation of Rio Grande del Norte National Monument, and I think there's some celebrations going on, so you don't have to come here tomorrow. I'll just go up there and enjoy that BLM crown jewel, right, Jenna? So I grew, I was born in, in Illinois, but my folks were teachers, and they came west to California in that great push in California in the early to mid-50s to grow the California education system, and uh, for the Stanford people, I grew up in Los Altos, essentially, which is very very close to Palo Alto, and spent a lot of time knocking around California, kind of in the on the loose era, if you remember that early Sierra Club publication. What got me really interested in, in the public lands is I was a park ranger at Glen Canyon in the 70s, and supposedly had the same job Ed Abbey had a few years after, after old Cactus Ed. But I got to do just about everything there from a little bit of, of rescue, which usually meant drunks on the lake when the wind came up, right? And they <clears throat> would tip their boats or whatever. But, and you also got to deal with these great questions from visitors such as, where are the teepees? And of course, if you know that country, that's Navajo, Hopi, Zuni land. Um, which side of the dam is the lake on? <laughs> and true. And as a friend that was a ranger at, at Mesa Verde was once asked, why did the Anasazi build so far from the railroad? <laughs> the only reason I bring those, and there's a million of those stories, is we tend to call those people voters, too, which is somewhat <laughs> disturbing. Um, I wanted to be a ranger, but decided to go back to Colorado State and got my PhD there. In the 80s, early 80s, when environmental natural resource policy was really becoming a field, and so I studied a little under Norm Wengert, who, as I understood it, wrote the first real article about natural resources as a field of policy studies in the 50s. And Phil Foss, who wrote a book in 1960 called Politics and Grass, which was about the tight relationship between BLM Western ranchers and Western congressmen. That book then got checked out a lot in the late 60s because politics and grass, start, <laughs> people thought it was about what's now legal certain places. However, they read it and found out that it was about some agency they never heard of called the BLM, cattle, grazing, and so forth. And that book was checked back in really fast. But for a time, it was very popular. Um, so anyway, that's my background. I'm fortunate to be able to work for C. Sandris, sort of a legendary Secretary of Interior, but I'm, bi I'm biased there. and and get to do a lot of public lands. We're gonna do a major Andrus conference early next week on why public lands matter, keynoted by the governor of Montana. Uh, I do want to announce that on my cell phone, uh, Speaker Ryan just announced that America would be living with Obamacare for the foreseeable future. <laughs> <laughs>
and you have to understand being a Democrat in Utah is a rather lonely position, so it's, <laughs> it's nice to be here. Um, in talking with the panel uh, beforehand, uh, I said I really want people to think about the future and, and not look through the rear view mirror. I think often policymakers and some academics are really good at telling us what happened in the past, no offense David, uh, but uh, we need to be looking at the future. And so I've asked each of the panelists to give us a brief description, if, the, if they were czar or czarina uh, of public lands, uh, what they would do as a matter of policy uh, in administering those public lands, mostly in, uh, in the West and particularly in the rural West. Tony? Um, I should preface uh, my comments uh, with a disclaimer in that I am here as Tony Rampton. I'm not here to speak on behalf of the Attorney General or the Governor or anybody else in state government. Um, I've been involved for the last five and a half years basically in disputes regarding federal public land policy. Uh, a lot of it's in a courtroom, some of it's outside of a courtroom. My biggest concern is that the debate with regard to the public lands is too often driven by ideology and not often enough driven by practical reality or the solving of problems. Ideologues drive lawsuits. They don't solve problems. Courts don't solve problems. Well, they do, but that's not the way public land policy should be formulated. It should be formulated by people talking and talking about common problems talking about common solutions and what will work on the ground. Uh, let me give you uh, an example. Uh, this is an episode that occurred about a year and a half ago. And Jenna uh, recalls this situation very well because she was involved. I was uh, about 15 months ago asked to attend a meeting in a small town in central Utah of some ranchers. I had no idea why I was going there. I was just asked by the Attorney General to go. I walked into a county office building into a room about the size of this room, probably a little smaller than this room, and it was absolutely packed with ranchers absolutely jammed, standing room only. They were angry, angry, angry. I sat there and I listened to Lavoie Finnegan, who's the gentleman who was killed up in Oregon in association with the Malher problem. And uh, Lavoie uh, voiced his position, waving a copy of the Constitution, that these ranchers had a constitutional right to run their cattle on the public lands without a permit. He actually said the permit took away their rights. It didn't give them rights. The next fellow that got up was packing a six shooter on his hip and he told these cowboys to form militias and start arming themselves. Then the guy that was running the meeting looked at me and he said, where's the attorney general on all of this? Is he going to support us? And so I stood up and I tried as best that I could to explain that what they had just heard was wrong and that there were better ways to address their problems. So I spent the next two hours going from cowboy to cowboy talking about their problems not philosophical problems, their problems on the ground, water concerns, grazing concerns, things that go along with their day-to-day -day life, 
but the biggest impression I carried away was that these people were frightened. They felt, they feel still like the environmental groups that are trying to drive ranchers off the public lands are not only threatening their livelihoods, they're threatening their way of life, their very culture. Their families have been on this land for generations. It is part of them, and they're afraid they're going to lose it. I went back to Salt Lake and I said, we've got to do something to help these people. We've got to do something or they're going to, somebody's going to get killed. This was before, obviously before Malher. Same group of people though. So I went back down to another meeting uh, a little later, about a week, two weeks later, and once again heard the same stuff that I'd heard before about these constitutional property rights to graze the public lands without permits. And I said, look, we'll go with you to help you with these problems. When you go with, to BLM to work out these problems, we'll go with you to help you. And the young cowboy in the back of the room said, how, soon, how much notice do you need? And I said, well, just tell me where you want me to go and when. And he said, how about tomorrow morning in Escalante, Utah? I said, I'll be there. The next day I met with this young cowboy and uh, BLM, they knew I was coming. So they had most of their senior people there in that Escalante office. And I started by uh, explaining what I just explained to you and that uh, I felt it was unfair that some of the things that were happening to these ranchers were happening to them. And I said, the state of Utah is going to start pushing back against these entities that are trying to drive these people off to public lands. Without exception, everybody in that room, all the BLM people, said, where have you been for the last 20 years? Because here you had the people on the ground that were trying to solve all of these problems that all of these ranchers were bringing to them. And they felt like they were tied up in knots because they weren't allowed to use their common sense to solve these problems, but rather they were being dictated to by higher ups that didn't really understand the situation on the ground, asking to adhere to some policies and procedures that didn't really make sense when applied to a specific rancher's problem. And they really struggled with it. They were struggling with it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> then we started going through a laundry list of this cowboy's problems all of which he'd been at loggerheads on with BLM. We just went down the list one at a time. We solved every single problem. Why? Because BLM heard the rancher and because the rancher heard BLM. And they said, this is a problem we can fix. That taught me a lot. That whole episode taught me a lot because I was dealing with ideologues on one end and ideologues on the other end. Nothing was getting solved in the middle. Nobody was paying much attention to what was happening on the ground. But when there was the kind of communication there should have been all along, problems were solved. In terms of what I would like to see happen with respect to the public lands in the future is that dialogue replace ideological battle. 
and that land managers and land users work together, talk, communicate, listen to each other, and work on common problems and common solutions. That's my idea of good public land administration. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Jenna? Sure, I'll go it's next. It's Arena, we should say. Um, I think, Tony, we're going to be in violent um, agreement because uh, I, too, um, really feel like conversation is going to be um, the only way that we really settle the dust on public lands. And um, I learned a lot about you at that Richfield meeting. Uh, I'd never seen so much courage as he, you know, basically prosecuted the case against tearing up your grazing permits. And um, I think with that, um, that single meeting, we really turned things around in Utah. And it's, I, I give um, a kudos to Tony on that. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna do just a mini digression, um, a flip my nerd digression, and maybe just to help explain why some of the fear and the anger from some of our traditional users. Um, for over a century now, we've, as a country, been debating um, what public lands are about. Should they be managed for national interest or local interest? Should they be protected? Should they be, should they be developed? Um, BLM's Organic Act, which is FLIPMA, the Federal Land Policy Management Act, was passed in 76 and um, made one thing clear, and that was that the lands were gonna be retained and managed for future generations under what's called a multiple use and sustained yield construct. Um, so that's what Flipma was clear about, but it, what it was really um, silent about was how, how to reconcile the competing interests. And so this multiple use sustained yield um, Balancing Act is we it, it still happens on a daily basis really, you know 40 years after FLIPMA was passed So that's what hasn't changed but um, what has changed and what I think is a, um, a threat to some of our BLM's traditional users is that the the demands on the public lands have really grown um, over the decades for a number of reasons some we've already talked about today that growth in the West is um, twice growth and employment in the West is twice what it is in the rest of the country. Um, technological advances are really pushing um, new demands on public lands. I mean, think about 10, 15 years ago, were we talking about hydro hydraulic fracturing or horizontal drilling, or um, could we have even conceived the big renewable um, energy projects that are now authorized on public lands? And um, Recreation, um, oh my goodness, I'll use Moab as an example. If you can imagine it, it's happening in Moab. Like, you don't even have to pedal your mountain bike anymore because they have little motors on them. They're called e-bikes. So, um, you know, the, I think that this, um, there's a, a lot more uses on the public lands. It's actually, as vast as they are, it's feeling a little bit crowded. Um, and so it's, it's definitely not my father's BLM, to be sure, and it's, I think the job's just gotten um, harder over the years. Um, so to, to Pat's question, um, I, think, I think BLM ignores local interests at its own peril because politically and geographically, these are Western lands. And so BLM, I think, really needs to strike a balance that's mindful of our rural communities. Um, and there's some refrains from what David uh, Hayes talked about last night, and um, David Tony is gonna keep me honest on this, so I studied range science, I know you're an attorney, so you help me out if I get into trouble. But um, there was a, a, the recent Headwaters report that David referred to that um, found, that they were trying to decide whether or not federal lands were a liability or an asset, and they found that um, rural counties with more federal lands grew um, significantly faster in three areas, population, employment, and personal income, income growth than in counties with less public lands. Now there's a footnote that David didn't mention last night and that a lot of that growth is in the Metro West and that a lot of our rural counties are, are um, honestly being um, left behind. 
But I think um, just in my lifetime and my, my dad's lifetime, we, the, the role of public lands is really shifting. Um, we continue to provide the natural resources for sort of the traditional extraction commodity sectors, but at the same time, um, BLM lands can offer recreation, tourism, um, just fantastic scenery that really attracts folks to, um, to uh, sort of the growing um, service economies. Um, so I think, you know, in my experience, nearly every rural community is really trying to diversify their economies. Uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a really great interview of the Gillette, Wyoming mayor on, it was on um, Marketplace on NPR. And she was saying how delighted Gillette is that Trump was elected as a president, <laughs> but they, they also realized that they can't just hang their hat on coal anymore. And so um, they're really trying to figure out how they can um, make Gillette an attractive place to live. And people, want, instead of just coming for the boom in oil or gas production, they you know, want to stay and raise their families. Um, so um, to my point, I think that the, the best hope for finding those just so balance um, between protection and development on our public lands is through collaborative planning efforts. And those are nothing new. Um, they started under Clinton. I want to say they started maybe after the staircase was created as a piece, uh, an olive branch, a bit of an olive branch. And um, you'll all remember under Bush, the four C's. So they really also pushed collaborative collaboratives. And under Obama, I think it just continued. In my view, they sort of, uh, under Obama, there was a third dimension that was added, which was to try um, work with stakeholders, um, but also across jurisdictions and on broader landscapes, um, like was done with sage grouse. Um, and, and land use plans, are those are the basic building block for BLM. It's how we make our decisions on how to manage public lands. Um, so, you know, that there have been some recent collaborative efforts, and, and neither of these are perfect, the two examples that I'm going to give, but I think that they could be a starting place. Um, one was the California Desert Renewable Energy, um, DRECP, I'm not going to get the acronym right, Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, but it was a broad landscape-based cross-jurisdictional collaborative effort to try to figure out where for renewable energy, but also where for conservation. And closer to home, um, the Moab Master Leasing Plan, which David also mentioned last night. Um, that was an effort to drill down on oil and gas and potash decisions. And Moab um, and Grand County, as well as San Juan County, but more Grand County, was really trying to figure out how to balance their recreation um, economy that they have, but also see a more guaranteed income of um, oil and gas revenues to the county. Um, some common denominators on those collaborative planning efforts are they're, that they're um, very explicit about like what to develop and what to conserve. Um, they identify what the trade-offs are and figure out what can be some mitigation to address it. And um, you know, for extra credit, they've worked across um, jurisdictions, but. I think without a doubt, there are lots of dynamics in play on, um, in the rural west and public land management is just one piece of it. But I do think that we need to, our best hope is we need to start talking with each other and have a conversation that helps us find what's the right balance and um, those quality compromises that will let rural communities thrive. Thanks. I want you to get back in the business, Jenna. I want you <laughs> back at BLM tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we've had a lawyer and we've had a practitioner, and now we'll have an academic and give us the 30,000 foot view and, and maybe some experience through the Andrews Center. John? No need to insult me now. Come on, <laughs> Pat. I'm going to put a map up real quick, mainly um, just to say that this is a project that I'm involved in. Um, through USGS, we're a, it's a cooperative ecosystem study unit grant. The only reason I put it up besides the obvious, the West is different point that anybody can see is, as they develop this, it's gonna do some, you're, you can zoom in on this, not on this site, but on the USGS site. We got some money from the Park Service and Centers for Disease Control 
for example, and this is going to relate to some of the stuff we heard earlier today, where people can zoom in enough to see where the where outside park and recreational opportunities are at the at a very local level to to begin to promote the idea of being outside as a healthy thing to do. Um, we're still developing some of that and, and obviously trying to get money to do it. Um, but I, I want, just wanted to mention that because we were talking about our panel, like how, do, how are we going to relate exactly to rural issues like rural health? And at least there's one way to think about that. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll, there's a lot of other layers that eventually be able to put on it as well. But obviously to do it now, to put it up here is just to illustrate, I think most of the room understands, but not everybody, why the public lands matter so much in the Western United States. Um, I should say that to, to talk about Pat's question, when Mal here blew up, uh, and Boise's about 110 miles from Burns, Oregon, we're by far the biggest town anywhere near there, and Boise's not that big. I mean, the greater area is maybe 400,000 now. Um, a lot of the FBI were in Boise and so forth and so on, and were cop being copied over. But I got calls from the media because, East Coast media, because they were like, well, what, there's some guy that actually knows something about this part of the country? But the funny part of it was, at least twice, I had East Coast media ask me either, who's the BLM? <laughs> Because if you look at that map, there's no BLM in the east, okay? Basically, there's a couple of little things, it right? Like reading glasses on. You yes, <laughs> exactly. So who's the BLM, and, and why does Black Lives Matter care about? <laughs> so when we talk about our public lands, there is an ignorance curve that goes up as we move east sometimes. Um, and, that, that, and I think... We, we have to remember that um, people as ranger, as a ranger, people didn't, I was a guy in a green uniform. They didn't, they wanted to ask park questions, forest questions. So there's a little, Westerners get it, but a lot of other people don't. But I totally agree with Tony that the pro, so much of the problem now is the ideology remains. People were talking about federal lands transfer in 1908 that the then chief of the Forest Service was saying, we don't want that because it'll, it'll mean that greed will take over and commercial interests will win and the states can't manage these lands. This is an old debate. It just comes back about every 15 years like cicadas do. And I'm sure to people like, like Tony and me, it's sort of like, here we go again. And, and again, these arguments come up that it's illegal for the federal government to have this land. No, it's not. That's been established through all sorts of course presidents and history for years, but it comes up again and again and again. John Leshy's written about it. Uh, his, their colleagues at UU have written about it, but it will come back again. That's unfortunate. The hope to me and what I would encourage, Pat, is it's very messy and it's very slow, but these collaboratives that are springing up around the West to solve local problems, whether they be primarily on BLM or Forest Service land, are, to me, places we start to pack the small-scale democracy again. And you start healing relationships that have kind of been torn asunder. We've got six or seven forest collaboratives in Idaho. We're a Forest Service state. Uh, much more than we're, a B we have a lot of BLM land, but there, we haven't seen the collaboratives develop quite as much in B on BLM land. We did have the Owyhee initiative that Senator Crapo passed that was a collaborative process. Probably got started by the threat of an Antiquities Act proclamation, but that's, that's a different story. And, and once a year they come together to talk about what they've learned, and what I've started to see is there's a need, and it, it maybe it's begun for an institution probably like um, maybe the Lane Center at Stanford that's got a lot more resources to try to grow the knowledge of collaborative processes so when one of these things starts up, people don't make easy mistakes that can be avoided. I mean, they take a long time. They require a lot of investment of, of people's energy. They're not the only answer, but they are when they tend to work better, diffusing the tension. And when the collaboratives really work, 
they can be successful against lawsuits from outsiders, judges have started to say, well, all these other people have come to agreement. You didn't even participate in that process. Why should I listen to you? All right. That's still got a long way to go, but that's what's beginning to happen. And sometimes then it can lead to legislation on something. And it's getting, it's getting timber off the forests again. Not, it, not in the old era of get the cut out, but simply you get enough local agreement that you can get some timber off, off of the forest as much in the name of restoration and sometimes fire, uh, not fireproofing, but sort of uh, dealing with some of the problems we've had on forests in the past. So there's, I think there's hope there, but it's a, again, it's not a panacea, but you're starting to see it throughout the West more and more. And I know Arizona's had some, New Mexico has had some. One of the things that, that concerns me, and it's kind of, David didn't talk about it last night, but I'm sure he would agree with this. Um, yeah, the West is changing, but the counter punch here is young people don't go outside as much. John Jarvis, who's an old friend of mine who ran the Park Service for eight years as director, um, came to Boise to give an Andrus talk, and that was one of the, those sort of at the end of his tenure, thing that was very much bothering him, and, and, and I know Secretary Jewell too, is when w my generation was young, that's what we did, a lot of us, mm -hmm. uh, is go, you know, go out and knock around and want to become park rangers or, or whatever we did, and certainly people from small rural, rural towns did the same thing. But the younger generation, you know what they're doing. They're, they're on their phones all the time. Um, there's an issue there in terms of the public lands are only to sustain by their users and the access to them. And if we lose people who care about those places because they've, they've kind of not been, dad didn't take them camping or things, those kinds of things, or they're more interested in these, these very high tech approaches to knowledge, we got a problem. And that, that's something we got to work on, Pat, I think, is, yeah, there's plenty of kids who do go out, but there's a lot more who don't. And I know John was certainly, um, he was finding creative ways to take some kids um, in the Bay Area to go out with their phones um, and, and start taking pictures of, of, of tide pools and so forth get and learn what those things were about and kind of interacting with high tech uh, uh, about what they were actually seeing on the ground. So that's, that's a concern. It's a different younger generation of, regarding public lands than I think a lot of us who grew up realized. So that's something that, that would worry me. But the collaborative stuff is what I hope the future is that can maybe diffuse some of this ideology that Tony talks about that I totally agree about. Good. Um, I want to make three observations. Um, I had told Bruce that I wouldn't make my own comments, but being me, I will. Uh, first, I think every uh, classroom, uh, particularly in K through 8, uh, should have, uh, through the internet, an access to a web-based camera that's focused on some public land near their school. Uh, if they begin to believe that they own that land, and they begin to understand some of the ecosystem dynamics that go there, I think that ownership is going to create a more responsible sense of stewardship. And I also think it would get uh, people out in the outdoors uh, rather than behind their uh, telephone. Se <laughs> Second idea, and, and this caused heartburn throughout the Department of Interior. Oh, David, David's here. He had some of this heartburn. Uh, I want to have an accounting system at BLM which would allow every citizen to hone in on the nearest BLM office and see what their budget was, how it was being spent, and how they might have a voice in doing that. The disconnect between tax dollars and how they're spent is phenomenal to me in a day and age when I can get on my bank account and see how much overdrawn my kids are uh, you know, it seems to me that we ought to apply that technology to every level of government, uh, to city, county, state, and the federal government. And I think uh, that it would obviously cause some heartburn. When I was in BLM, I found that each of the 13 state directors uh, 
had secretly sequestered away money, and Ed Hasty, who ran California, had $35 million <laughs> that he had put away, and when I brought it all back to Washington, they were very unhappy. They got a little bit better when I put it directly in the field to field offices so they could use it. So we need to have more accessible, transparent budget process as it goes along. And then finally, and this is going to cause some heartburn for my environmental friends, uh, the uh, Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, SUA, uh, I recently worked out, as Tony was talking about, a conversation that avoided a two-year litigation process and probably saved everybody a great deal of money, although I think SUA probably could raise more money uh, from their donors by having this lawsuit than they will be able to by having resolved it. And that is the prevailing party in environmental matters has to pay, uh, excuse me, the losing party in, in uh, environmental litigation has to pay the litigation costs. Uh, I am tired of strike lawsuits. Uh, when I was at BLM and we went home to Utah and Debbie and I refinanced our house, the closing agent came running in and said, you've been sued 850 times. I said, yes, that was my public capacity. Uh, so we, we were able to close. <clears throat> but I, I think courts and, quite frankly, lawyers are the last group of people that you want to do sustainable uh, land policy. And I've written to Secretary Zinke, and I spoke to uh, the for Neil Cornsey, the former director, we need to have civil servants head the land management agencies, not have political people like me try to learn uh, in a few months what to do. Uh, the average length of time of a Senate-confirmed presidential appointee is 18 months. And believe me, you don't have enough time to really manage it. So in each of the cabinet uh, areas, Department of Agriculture, Department of Interior, Interior, there ought to be maybe five political appointees and the rest should be civil servants who are held to a high standard. Uh, that's the Shea input. Uh, now, we have a choice here. Uh, my own preference would be to ask people in the audience for questions or comments. Uh, I had asked uh, each of the panelists to describe in the last 30 years, and I'll extend it 40 years so we cover FLIPMA, uh, the Organic Act for BLM, what mistake has been made and what could have been or should have been done in that time period. Now, by a show of hands, who would like to have questions from the audience and who would like to uh, rediscover? Well, you can do both. You're, you're <laughs> why, why don't you ask a all right, all right. I'll, Bruce, Bruce, being the wiser of us, uh, is t telling me. So let's begin with John. Uh, tell us what you think was a major policy mistake in the last 40 years, uh, and if you could go back uh, and correct it, what would it be? You know, I don't, if I'm going to focus on somebody, it's not going to be the career BLM people, <laughs> all right? Um, sometimes the politicals are the ones who make ill-conceived decisions, perhaps. Um, I wouldn't call it mistakes in that that's a lot of public land politics. For example, I think Secretary Babbitt, who was, a, in my opinion, a great secretary, tried to take on too much at the very beginning of his tenure where he wanted to look at both um, mineral law reform, which I think any rational person would say it's time, um, and then he wanted to take on grazing reform at the same time. Well, guess who you just pissed off? A lot of people at the, you know, pick one maybe, try to work on that, and then have something else to do. Um, there, you know, usually uh, uh, picking on Democrats a little bit, I think Secretary Salazar, and Jenna was helping me think this through, it was with the wil wilderness study? The, the wildlands. The wildlands policy they came up with like the day before Christmas, which wasn't well presented, and he had to pull it back because most of the Western delegation went nuts on it because they hadn't really been told much about it. Um, Republicans have made, you know, a lot of mistakes too, certainly. Um, and so I don't, I, I don't think there's any been a fatal flaw. It's just I don't think Potomo-centric decision-making that's, that's kind of dropped on the West without a lot of consultation works very well. And I don't, I don't care who's in charge. 
which takes us back to Tony and others' point, you got to consult with the local folks, even if sometimes you maybe don't agree with them. They matter. Jenna? I was going to hope to abstain since my boss, <laughs> boss, uh, former boss boss is in the room. Like, I can't be bipartisan <laughs> on my criticism. But you have your lawyer with me. My, okay, I'm free. Okay. Well, I'll choose a, um, a Republican one, though. But I've, I contributed to the blooper, the wildland blooper idea, but um, I think one that, and I'm, I'll raise it just because I think it might be um, Groundhog's Day, is um, under Bush there was just um, oil and gas drilling was pushed to the point where right. even the Republican traditional allies like ranchers and um, sportsmen were up in arms. Matter of fact, I think that the, the Utah governor, I know both Democrat and Republican governors Cha were, began challenging the leasing that was going on in um, areas that were, um, you know, either habitat for, for whatever reason. There are special places for recreation or habitat or whatever. Um, and so I think that was one, and, it, and it's kind of an interesting bit of history too, because I think because of that sort of overreach, um, we got a lot of things like, um, I think restore New Mexico because there was a push to drill into Otero Mesa. There's a lot of New Mexicans in this room that knows this better than I do. But, um, you know, and the concept of mitigation because we were trying to figure out, well, now what do we do? We've got all these holes in the ground. How do we mitigate them? Um, but yeah, I've just, I keep in touch with folks in the agency and I'm just hearing sort of the same things where, um, the bureau is taking a cut. The bureau is taking an 11% cut, but guess what? They they want to preserve the oil and gas and coal, so the conventional or fossil fuel development is going to stay whole or get bigger, and that just means that everything else is going to take an even bigger hit. And you know, putting together a task force to um, to expedite APD APDs. Um, so I don't know. That that's my one, and then. When you go to Tony, he'll hopefully pick on a Democrat. <laughs> um, <clears throat> first, I'll say that the Wildlands decision is still being litigated. I'm lead counsel in that case, and we're still litigating Wildlands, which is now morphed into lands with wilderness characteristics. So it's a problem that continues, and it's an enormous problem. Uh, once again, I don't think that uh, litigation is the way to solve that problem. In terms of what decision has been made, uh, you know, <clears throat> FLIPMA was a sea change in the way the public lands were thought of and administered by the federal government. And it scared the daylights out of state and local officials because they saw it as removing them entirely from the decisions uh, over lands that they'd used for generations. They built in some protections. They built in requirement that there be cooperation between the feds and state and local government. They built in consistency reviews, and they built in multiple use and sustained yield. All of those were seen by state and local officials as protections for them. My biggest concern, the biggest problem I deal with daily is that at least the perception is, and I think there's a good deal of truth to it, the perception is that over that 40-year period, we've me moved away from coordination with state and local government, we've moved away from consistency reviews with state and local land use plans, and we've moved away from multiple use. Those three things have caused as much of the anger and frustration and fear that is held by people on the ground in these rural communities than anything else. Talk to them, coordinate with them, look at their land use plans, talk about multiple use. It doesn't have to mean multiple use on each piece of ground, but you can find uses 
appropriate to one piece of ground that wouldn't be appropriate to another piece of ground. Just by l walking through these problems with these people, you'll bring them 90% of the way. But that just hasn't been happening. Um, I do want to make one observation, and I'm glad David raised his hand. Uh, I was talking about failures, but one success that I witnessed was uh, David Hayes and Secretary Babbitt negotiating a resolution uh, of the lower Colorado states on the Colorado River Compact, an amazing, amazing job that required high political uh, diplomacy, uh, skill, and it actually worked. After it was over, I don't know if it was David or, or Secretary Babbitt, I said, so when are you going to do the Upper Colorado? And they looked at me and said, no, no, <laughs> we're never going to touch that. But it, that kind of collaborative effort, I think, is something that we should be uh, studying, and I think it fits in each of uh, the arenas. David, you had a question or comment. So my question, um, goes to what all of you think about the role of planning uh, for BLM. The, the topic is look forward 30 years uh, and, and how can planning be done in a, in a good way? And I wanna, if you'll indulge me for a minute, uh, give a two quick uh, factual backdrops that may or may not help answer it. Um, when, uh, Secretary Salazar decided to push for solar on our public lands. Uh, we took a, a programmatic EIS involving six southwestern states that BLM had underway, did a mid-course correction and said, let's actually try to do some real planning here and identify criteria for solar energy areas, areas that make sense on our public lands to have these big footprint projects. And the result of that was, uh, I think, made a lot of sense where you had a lot of areas that actually weren't appropriate for, for solar for a lot of reasons, both physical and otherwise. Uh, and, and then you had some areas that made a lot of sense because there was connectivity, et cetera. That was a first real landscape scale at a huge scale planning effort. Uh, you can't, in a situation like that, kind of get down to the treetop level and have the community-based discussions. Although if you set the criteria and don't try to do the whole thing at once, then you can have those discussions. And in fact, I hope BLM will continue it. Um, and I will say that I was disappointed that the U.S. Senate, uh, through the Congressional Review Act, uh, and I'd be appreciate your views on this, um, uh, nullified Planning 2.0, which was a BLM rule that, that, that incorporated this concept of, of planning. Second quick factual circumstance, Utah, where in the Bush administration, there was a tremendous effort to do new uh, resource management plans in eastern Utah, covering four, three or four million acres. A lot of great work was done. At the end of the day, however, the four, four BLM folks actually in the different regions didn't know quite what to do. This led to the problem of the 77 leases that were canceled at the beginning of the, of the administration. My penance to get confirmed by the Senate Senator Bennett said, you got to look into this and, and figure out the situation and come to Vernal, Utah for a town meeting. That was fun. Uh, and, and, but what we found was that um, ideology got in the way. Uh, and while that great work was done, at the end of the day, there was no final help to the BLM folks in the different areas of that three or four million acres as to where the, or it made sense for oil and gas and where it didn't. And what, what the, the Moab situation came out of that, because a lot of those, a number of those 77 acre uh, leases were in southern Utah where there was no oil and gas infrastructure. Uh, it was a, a huge recreational. Uh, uh, but, but the BLM folks down there, as a result of those RMPs, had no guidance from their communities about, and, and sort of the state as a whole. So, um, and that kind of, kind of cuts both ways, because if you're going to do Big scale planning, you may not get down to that level, and yet you need to. So uh, it's a really hard no, question hard. to me as to how you do effective planning going ahead. I'd just be interested in everyone's views on that. Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you had to live with it. <clears throat> um, 
Well, I don't know. It's it's it was to my point is that um, there's we've tried it in a couple places. There was recently a postmortem done on DRECP that I think would be really good to look at for lessons learned. Um, I, I think I can't remember who it was that said that you can get to that ninety percent. And I think we, at least on the Moab MLP, I know there wasn't complete happiness on it, but there was a lot of alignment with the community after a lot of conversations. And um, I think that you, you just have to get as far as you can get and knowing that not everybody's going to be happy. One of the observations I would make is I first worked in Washington in 1969. There were 2,500 staff people on the Senate side. There were 10,000 people on the House side, including the Library of Congress. In 2012, there were 10,000 people in the Senate side and 30,000 people in the House side without the Library of Congress. So one of the things that I felt when I was with BLM was that you were on this treadmill that was simply going too fast for policymakers to really sit down and think about policy and it was more get you politics. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I was summoned to the Hill to explain the inexplicable and they simply wanted to be able to get a news release that the BLM director had been brought forward and scoured uh, by their elected representative, which was part of my job. Um, any other options, John? Real quick, uh, to David's question, it's probably too late, but Jen and I were looking to see if President Trump had actually signed the repeal of 2-0, and it didn't look like he had yet, and it's probably too late, but I would, I would hope that Zinke would go to the president and say, don't sign this, let me try to work on the regulations, because we all know that under this process, it defaults to the 1980 regs, which are way out of date. And I mean, maybe it's too late for that, but that's my pie in the sky hope that, that, and I don't know if he's only got X number of days to sign it, if it's a regular piece of legislation, or that's different that he has more time. That I, I'd need a, a legislative scholar to answer that one. Uh, Bruce? I, I want to go back to the uh, very important point about collaborations at the local level. And we've been looking at that at the Lane Center in the context of California and water collaborations. And the data, I think, show that these are good things in terms of bringing stakeholders on board. But there are a couple problems as a political scientist that I don't think we've thought about enough in political science. And they are, one, a selection bias in terms of the stakeholders. That is, how much care you put into reaching out and making sure you get a representative group of stakeholders at the table. And the second is the issue of closure. That is, how do you get closure uh, when the people that are running the operation don't necessarily have training in how to weigh off different costs and benefits? That's normally something you expect the political sector to do, but of course, NEPA and a lot of other laws hand this down to the local level. So you've got agency officials that aren't necessarily trained as uh, you know, democratic representatives trying to weigh different groups. And so I guess I want to know, do you see these problems arising in the collaborations you've been involved in? Do you see any best practices? Does it make sense to train agency officials in these kind of mediation skills to a greater degree? It makes total sense to, to train them. One of the interesting problems that's developed is that historically, now we're more Forest Service, the Forest Service moves people. And so that's how one moves up in the agency. You, you stay a place for so many years and you move. Now, the reason for that is historically in Kaufman's Forest Ranger, you get wedded to the profession and the agency and you don't, quote, marry the natives. But today to have successful collaborations, you get a good agency person, they develop the relationships, Bruce, and then they're gone. Now, we could go forever on this, some collaboratives, want the agency there, but they don't want them to be a formal rep. To solve some of those problems you're talking about governance, sometimes a collaborative will appoint a, a subcommittee to deal with a problem and have them recommend it up. There's a million different ways they deal with this. And yeah, their best practices is I think what we don't know enough about. So somebody that gets one going doesn't make a, a mistake that another person can say, we tried that, don't do that. But a lot of it's idiosyncratic based on the personalities in the room, um, too. So it's 
to me, it's pretty pretty complicated to figure it out. Yeah. Tony. It's terribly complicated, and it's not the same everywhere. It's different wherever you are. And one thing that offends uh, locals on the ground is that they think that Washington thinks they're all fungible, that they're all the same, and one one size fits all, and that's the way planning's done. We figure out what's good on a broad scale, and we apply it on a local scale, and that's all there is. And that's a mistake. Now, how you go about parsing all that out and weighing the local input into the decision-making process, I think that's something that should be looked at carefully and a methodology and a, a, a format established that pr allows you to do that because right now it's ad hoc. There's no consistency and uh, there needs to be considerable study uh, and uh, some kind of a framework needs to be developed. In the uh, Middle Ages, they discovered marriage was a way of having sustainable closure, and uh, maybe we need to do that again. P please identify yourself. Uh, Craig Thomas. Um, I want to ask Jenna, because you just came out of the hotbed in D.C. Um, so there's a lot of talk about environmental laws being gutted or changed under Congress, although maybe they won't be able to accomplish it. But with regard to FLIPMA, can you see changes forthcoming in FLIPMA that could be helpful or harmful for collaborative efforts and for people getting along at the local level? Or do you think anybody would ever revisit FLIPMA? Um, so in preparation for this conference, I actually did a little bit of reading. I read Skillam's book. Um, the nation's the, largest landowner. Na yeah, nation's, nation's largest, largest landowner. landowner. Um, and so you know, what I learned from that is that in 1976, when they passed Flipman, they couldn't get agreement. And that's why we have a mission that is so big and broad, you can drive a bus through it. I mean, a lot of good things happen with Flipman, but there's still a lot of ambiguity. And, um, you know, honestly, with a, where, kind of where we are right now, I don't really see that Flipman's um, going to change. And maybe it doesn't even need to change. Maybe it's more um, having, a, maybe gains or made in, in a ground game, you know, in region by region to kind of settle the dust? It's a good question. Um, you know, I've periodically thought over the last few years that maybe what we need is another public land law review commission, uh, right. the sort of thing that produced yeah. FLIPMA. Uh, but given the political situation right now and the ideologies that are at play and the divisions that exist, I just don't think that that would be productive. I think that would be yeah. calamitous. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that if you're going to monkey with FLIPMA, you monkey with, it's kind of like Obamacare. Don't throw it out, just make it better. So uh, I think that th that's the way it ought to be approached. Yeah. See, I think one of the things I would suggest is to have more regional regulatory uh, efforts uh, because you're not going to get it through Congress. Uh, it's just too, too divided. And until we come up with some rebirth of a notion of social contract, I doubt that you'll see any national legislation in land management or, for that matter, natural resource area. Other questions? <coughs> Comments? Yes. Thank you, I'm Bill Neal, and I came down from Oregon for this particular session. I'm a huge supporter of public lands. However, I, have very, I don't even have any criticism of the philosophies. I think you've really done a very good job. But I'd like to divert your attention for just a moment to the TSA. I think they have a wonderful vision to do. They have a, a job we all need. But until you're the guy that walks through the scanner, and he tells you to take your boots off, and you tell him you're 75 and you don't have to, and you spend the next two hours in his pen, you will begin to understand where I'm going. I truly believe that the Malheur thing could have been diffused two years before it ever began. I absolutely believe that. And the guys that up there were up there weren't our Oregonians, and they went up to Washington also. 
But what I want to point out to you is the implementation. A man who's lived on the land all his life goes into the local BLM office where he encounters an agent, often a young one, because they do move around, as you know. He wants a woodcutting permit. He wants to move a fence. He wants to change the access to the stream that he's had to fence off so his cattle can... And he gets a no. Sometimes not even a very polite no. And he doesn't care about the overall philosophy. This, I think, this would diffuse the entire public lands. The guy doesn't give a damn who owns the ground. He wants to talk to somebody who can either bend the rules, and I don't even think they need to be bent, but has enough authority to think it through and say, yes, it's all right to take a wagon in there and pick up the old barbed wire we're collecting out of the Steens Mountain Cooperative, which is one of the high points of the... I mean, this was all done locally. You guys know what I'm talking about. The rest don't. And as an example, they had miles of rolled up barbed wire they wanted to get off the ground. I offered to drive a team and wagon in there, no mechanized stuff, and haul it all out. Couldn't get a permit. The local guy said, no, it's not. And little things like this, and I'm not trying to use myself as an example, I'm asking you, the most encouraging words I've heard all along is what Tony said in his opening remarks. That really gave me some hope and thought that at the local level, these things would diffuse all across the West the kinds of philosophical arguments you can have in Washington and in your offices, but right at the local level, this would bring people back to understanding and realizing that you people are listening to them and they may have something to say and accommodating their needs. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. John? Yeah, that's great. Quick response. Um, the cliche we sometimes say is the problem isn't multiple use, it's managing multiple users. But there, you remember those classic surveys where they'd tell you what kind of career you wanted to have and you'd go through it? Well, one of those was, was sort of done. And um, if you said you wanted to work with data or things, then you should become a forester, for example. But if you wanted to work with people, no. You, you, forestry wasn't for you. And I think the problem, in, to barely simplify it, is the, it's partly our fault in the universities. Training those people, and it's not Stanford or Boise State, we're innocent, it's the land grants <laughs> where most of those students go, they're not taught that. They're, they don't understand that they're going into a field that is hardly charged with political conflict. They think they're getting an expertise and, and sort of they don't want to deal with people and then they're thrown into those circumstances and they don't know what to do. Now the savvy ones learn, they become great at that, but I think that's one of the problems is there's a lack of fit between the skills those people need to have now to work with a guy who want, wants in just wanting to cut the wood. Yeah, I think I, that's part of the problem. I'm going to bring this to a close and ask okay. Jenna and Tony if they have any final words they'd like to <laughs> make uh, observations or comments. Just, I guess to add to your point, I mean, a lesson I learned, um, luckily learned early, is the most important thing you do is who you hire. And at least in Utah, we really worked hard to hire people that would get, you know, that person who comes through the door that needs help and, you know, have an appropriate response for them. So. Uh, I would just like to leave you with my impression. I spend a lot of time working with people from small communities. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours driving them the small roads within their community, talking about their history and their family's history. And these are people that love the land. They've given their lives to the land. They're great conservationists. They want to help. They want to be helped. Uh, and so to any administrator, I would say, realize that these people just wants to get by what this gentleman is saying. They want to get by day by day, and they need to know that the federal government will help them, not hurt them. Uh, I paid pretty uh, compliment at the beginning, but I now have to tell you the punishment side. She won't let you out of this room or on the bus back to the hotel unless you've filled out this questionnaire. So. Uh,
<laughs> or eating. Uh, but I also want to recognize, as Charles did, the Eccles family. Uh, there's a really interesting story in Washington that there was a fight between Mariner Eccles and the Secretary of Interior, Harold Ickes, about who got this prime parcel of land. Uh, Ickes won out, and so the Federal Reserve is kitty-cornered where the Department of Interior is. But the Eccles family have continued a tradition of which you are the beneficiaries today. And I really think, Hope and Randy, I hope that you will convey uh, the wisdom that is continuing to be passed from generation to generation. So thank you, and thank you for your attention.